FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today's 52920. Well, looks like we've gone from a bailout nation to a bailout world. The number and scope of the bailouts that are taking place in the so-called civilized Western world are shocking, to say the least. They're going to have ramifications that none of the proponents are even thinking about now, don't even want to know about, have denied the possibility. But like we said, no politician ever didn't get reelected because he gave away too much money. And however, but politicians do suffer election day defeats when they lock down their citizens and prohibit their free movement around the country, all in the name of protecting you. Well, we'd like to know your opinion on the bailouts, the lockdowns. Why don't you send us an email KL at KerryLutz.com, KL at KerryLutz.com. Right now, John Rubino is with us a little later in the week than usual, but it was good that we waited, John, because we got so much bailout news. I mean, I kind of got a little bit of my bailout. I hope you got yours. Hey, Kerry. Yeah, you know, we could kind of wait forever to do our interviews and, and the news would keep getting crazier and crazier. <laughs> So yeah. by that, I, I guess we can't do that. We keep we we're going to keep having to do our interviews because uh, um, it's always good enough the news <laughs> to talk about. But you're right. It keeps getting better. Like, here's what we waited for, you know, for um, that we couldn't have talked about on Monday, but that we could talk about today. Um, Japan just announced a one trillion dollar um, bailout for its economy. And that's 40 percent of GDP for one bailout plan. You know, that's not their first, it probably won't be their last, but this particular one that they just announced is 40% of GDP, all of which is borrowed money that they have to basically just monetize by printing new yen. And the yen is still a strong currency. <laughs> Go figure. Um, meanwhile, the uh, the EU just announced an $846 billion um, or euro equivalent of billion of that, mu that many dollars. Um, uh, liquidity plan. And that's not their first or probably not their last either. So it just goes on and on. These insanely large numbers, um, you know, and included in the EU thing was a an offer to Lufthansa of a $10 billion bailout, which the airline um, turned down because some of the other um, strings that came with that money were too stringent in their mm -hmm. opinion. So, but, but anyhow, everybody um, is getting bailed out. The numbers are just astounding and there, there's not really an end in sight. You know, a lot of these economies are starting to open back up and the, the openings are, are in most cases not going too badly. Korea's got a problem. They, they opened up and they might they may have to reimpose some restrictions because um, they've got a lot of new cases of coronavirus. But in the U.S. and elsewhere, it's not going too badly. Um, so, because this was the big fear that uh, that economies would start to open up, people would start to get sick again, and they would have to go back on lockdown. And then where does it end? You know, because we aren't going to have um, a cure that everybody agrees upon or a vaccine for quite a while, and. If, if we can't open back up, then we're in a, a never ending depression. So it's really important that the openings that are happening now um, work on some level. You know, we, we won't get back to 100 um, percent, you know, business at movie theaters and cruise ships for a long time, if ever. But if we get back to, you know, 60 or 70 percent, then we've kind of sort of got a functioning economy um, that might be able to avoid just a, a depression that never ends. So that's what we, we've got to shoot for now. And, you know, there's reason for cautious optimism that enough places are opening up without it becoming a disaster that maybe the rest of us can do the same thing, you know, which is nice. I'm in Washington state and a lot has to happen before normal life returns out here. Um, but, um, you know, it looks like there's light at the end of this tunnel. 
which is great, but it, it doesn't take us back to normal, even if everybody goes back to work because of all the debt we talked about at the beginning of the show. You know, we, uh, we're going to be even more deeply indebted, indebted by, by a huge amount when and if we get back to normal, and then we've got to carry that debt and figure out what to do with it. So um, normal in the sense of, say, the uh, the 1980s or 1990s financial system is never going to happen again. Mm-hmm. And our, our choices between, it looks like, between something where we just muddle along for a while longer, printing huge amounts of new currency and borrowing huge amounts of new money uh, and keeping interest rates super low because we can never raise them again, or just spinning out of control from all the new money we're creating and and going into, uh, you know, going from a deflationary slash depression like crash to accelerating inflation that we can't do anything to stop. Um, And that's out there somewhere. But the question is one of timing, really. Do we uh, do we go straight into that next year or or do we muddle along for a while before we go into that? But uh, normal in the sense of normal and healthy is never coming back. Yeah, uh, the so-called new normal. Well, I think we'll, we haven't really had the normal since the, since the last financial crisis. John, you know, I would argue, and I think you agree, that what we saw pass for normal was nothing like normal. It was just basically government money feeding all the markets, feeding real estate, feeding you name it, everything, college, tuition, student loans, government debt. It was just a money printing exercise. And now that things have gotten really bad, they're just printing up more money. And really, uh, those who fail to learn the lessons of the past are condemned to repeat them. Well, you, you can um, create the illusion of health and normality by borrowing money. And sometimes you can do that for a really long time. Uh, You know, we have millions of people in the US who've done that for um, years, if not decades, where there's a a new pre-approved credit card application in the mailbox every six months or so. And you you take that out and and get the card and you max that out and you move your um, balances from your other cards onto that card and so on. And then you do a a debt consolidation loan through, home equity line of credit or something like that. And and that buys you another few years. Meanwhile, the debt is mounting and mounting and mounting until it blows up on you. But you you can do that for a really long time in a financialized system where there's lots of easy money available from lenders who are mostly just packaging those loans and selling them to credulous institutional investors like uh, pension funds. So we got this kind of daisy chain where the government creates a bunch of money uh, and that allows institutional investors to buy bad debts off of banks, which allow banks to create more bad debt and so on uh, uh, until the music stops. So the question becomes, is this latest borrowing binge enough to make the music stop or can we do this for a while? And I, I don't know. It's 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 hard to imagine these numbers getting much bigger, but it was hard to imagine them getting bigger from, you know, 2006 levels. And by God, they did get bigger from there. So it's hard to say. But the next year is going to be really interesting if if we don't drop back into lockdown and Mostly people go back to work and um, and businesses reopen, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's it's going to be really interesting to see how everybody who took on all this extra money um, handles it. Because one of the things that we haven't talked about and you don't see very often um, is that corporations went on a borrowing binge in this last month. You know, they, uh, they maxed out their... Um, credit lines with banks, and they issued a whole bunch of new debt because the um, the market had an appetite for high-grade debt. So um, good quality corporate buyer, borrowers could borrow a lot of money, and they did. So the, um, the U.S. corporate sector is now as highly levered as it's ever been. Uh, and we didn't get rid of any student debt or 
car loans or any, yeah. actually quite a few car loans have defaulted, but there's still a ton of it. Not out. enough. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I want to buy so that Tesla for 5,000 uh, at the used car lot because there's no used car market now either. Well, see, I, I'm kind of in the market for a pickup truck. So that sounds good. You know, it, it would be nice to have a few months of nobody buying any used cars and, and dealers having to, to give their inventory away. But, um, you know, what, what most people do when they do that is they, they borrow to buy that new car. So mm -hmm. even if, you know, they get a good deal, they still have to take out a big loan to, to get their car. And that means um, auto loans go up, assuming the banks are willing to do that anymore. Because at, at the same time, you've got some entities out there borrowing like crazy. Uh, you've got the banks tightening, for instance, mortgage criteria. And presumably car loan criteria, at least I hope they're they're tightening that side of their lending. Um, but and, and there was also a um, remember when the small business administration loans were, were being handed out to everybody. Sure. Um, I think it was J.P. Morgan Chase who came out and said they were not making any more loans at all except Correct. the government guaranteed variety. So only those small business loans that the government was going to cover no matter what. That's all the lending they were willing to do. So so in other words, the banks have to come come back from that cliff where they're not willing to lend to anybody before even the semblance of normality can return. Um, and it's not clear why banks will do that unless it comes with some kind of a government guarantee when they can feast on these guaranteed loan programs and make basically guaranteed money. You know, once you're, um, once you're used to absolutely risk-free returns, it's hard to get interested in stuff that actually carries a risk. So it takes a while for the financial system to kind of, uh, you know, pull its head out um, from under undercover and, uh, and, and be willing to look around at opportunities again. You know, for a while, it all you think of is risks. So, so we have to go through that, too. So, so 20, well, the second half of 2020 and, and all of 2021 are just going to be this fascinating time when, uh, when the whole world has to figure out um, how and if to, um, to become a normal financial system and, and economy again. And, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's hard to see it happening quickly and it's easy to envisioning it never happening at all, but we'll have to see. Yeah. Well, you obviously missed my latest, uh, writing piece a couple of weeks ago called the emperor has no cortex, uh, <laughs> about, uh, Joe Biden. We already know what Trump is going to do about the debt, which is nothing. And we've got multiple debt bubbles ready to blow up all around us here, John, all over the place. Yeah. All well, over. yeah. I mean, we, we always did have all of these bubbles that were ready to pop. And um, now we've got the government coming in and keeping them from popping because you can't allow anything to fail now. You know, everything's too big to fail. Um, but on a brighter note. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we can always about, use a brighter note, John. Yeah. You know, who, who is the biggest beneficiary? Who gets the biggest bailout of anybody out there? Oh, the banks, and of course. I, I would argue that it's the gold miners. Yeah, well, yeah. They, but indirectly, yes, I agree with you. Yeah, because so e true. every every bailout, let's say the Lufthansa thing goes through and it's $10 it billion. Will. Dollars. It will. It's well, just a question of some I's that need to be dotted yeah. and some T's that need to be crossed. And because they're not going to let Lufthansa no. go belly up. It's German pride. It's everything that's tied up. No, it will never happen. Just okay. like the state of Illinois will not go bankrupt either. No. Okay. So we'll bail. Let's be Illinois. That's a better example for us. So let's say they have to bail out Illinois and it's $50 billion. Could be a lot more than that, but let's say it's 50 billion. So the, the first effect of that is to calm people down who, who were worried about Illinois defaulting on their debt. Okay. So, um, that segment of the financial system calms down. And then the people who were worried about the knock on effects of Illinois going bankrupt, like forcing New York and California into bankruptcy, they don't have to worry anymore either. So that's the first effect. The second effect is everybody looking at that $50 billion and going, oh, okay, that's another 50 billion the Fed has to print. So what happens when they're, they're printing all this currency, you know, and, and, uh, and that spooks people into safe haven assets, which makes the price of gold go up, which we've seen it go up during this crisis. 
largely for that reason. You know, everybody's expecting huge amounts of uh, money creation, and they're wondering what that does to inflation, blah, 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 and, and they're, they're buying gold. Um, and that widens the margins of the gold miners. So you're going to see, you know, Newmont and Barrick and, and most of the mid-tier miners um, um, churn out really good numbers in the next year because the thing they're selling is up in price. So that and that's basically, you know, free margin increase. They don't, they don't have to do anything extra to sell gold for two thousand dollars an ounce than at fifteen hundred dollars an ounce. Um, they just take that extra money and move it right down to the bottom line. So you're going to see the miners producing really good numbers. And it's going to be a um, at least in part because of all these bailouts. So I, I think you could argue that every single bailout, no matter who it is, is getting the money also flows in part back to the gold miners. Uh, so they're, they're really in a sweet spot in this economy because th there's no way interest rates are ever going to be able to go back up again, especially now that we've taken on all this new debt, which, which means that rising interest rates increase the cost of all that existing debt out there when it gets rolled over. And you can't have that. That would bankrupt everybody. So interest rates have to stay low forever. And the these bailouts guarantee that as if it wasn't already guaranteed. Now it's double guaranteed. And that's great for gold, too. So I, I don't know. I think that's the, the miners are among the only beneficiaries the of this whole thing across the board. Because, you know, Netflix is going to go back down when when the economies of the world um, go off lockdown because we've all watched everything there is to watch on Netflix. And so we'll cancel our subscription and Netflix will stop being a high flyer. And there's um, uh, so much competition, too. Let's not forget yeah. that they don't have anything proprietary anymore. The only thing they had was first mover advantage. That's gone now. You have Amazon. You got 58 different streaming. You got Disney. Yeah, everybody is streaming. It's a streaming world. And it's just that Netflix is an app that's on a lot of smart TVs. So it's kind of like putting Sirius XM gratuitously for the first three to six months on a new car radio. Same difference. Yeah. So so you take um, Netflix out of the equation and that leaves Amazon and a couple of other com companies that that probably They'll they'll do fine, but they won't have the growth arc that they have right now when everybody goes off, uh, off lockdown and they can actually go back to Costco and Walmart and buy stuff, you know, and they don't have to buy it online. Um, so they won't report killer numbers either. So it's not clear who in the year ahead reports blowout numbers other than the gold miner. If gold stays yes. up, which it ought to because of all the uh, the debt that we've created now and that we then have to service going forward with newly created currency. So I, I think this is uh, one of the, the very few sectors that you can say with a high degree of certainty are going to be just fine going forward. Yeah. So I think the, uh, the miners are, are mostly buys now. And let's not forget the decline in energy prices, which is one of their main production components, labor. Right? Is oil still down? I haven't no, watched it's, it for a while. It's in the mid, low 30s, 32, okay, 33. That's... If I was any business that relied upon petroleum in any manner of my business, that I am going to be buying energy in the form of gasoline, uh, diesel, or jet fuel, or anything else, I'd be buying up those futures right now because it's a guaranteed that even if it goes higher than this or even if it goes a little lower or it stays the same, you've locked in your energy cost components, which for mining, you know it's huge. Those huge trucks and those excavators and all the equipment, you know, incredibly energy intensive. So I'd be buying them up. If I was Southwest Airlines, and you know that they are a huge hedger. They probably bought three to five years worth of oil, oil production. Uh, the only thing they're paying for is the contango. And if they buy options, then they're just paying a time premium. But really, it's the natural hedge. I hope that Barrick and Newmont and the other producers have been doing this. If they're not, 
then they've really been negligent. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Trilogy Metals is a world-class developer in Alaska's Ambler Mining District. The company already possesses 8 billion pounds of copper, 3 billion pounds of zinc, over 1 million gold equivalent ounces, and now over 77 million pounds of cobalt. Trilogy's Arctic project boasts an after-tax net present value of $1.4 billion with a 33% IRR. Trilogy is led by an experienced management team with proven success in discovering and developing projects in Alaska. The company is well capitalized, has no debt, and possesses strong institutional support. Trilogy trades on the New York and Toronto exchanges under the ticker symbol TMQ. To learn more, go to TrilogyMetals.com. That's TrilogyMetals.com. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Well, you know, for the airlines, um, buying a lot of fuel in the futures market is a risk-free operation because normally that's risky, right? If, yeah. if the cost of fuel goes against you, then you have to eat the difference in those futures contracts. But if, if it goes seriously against them, the government still has to bail them out. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, let's face it, their risk is limited. Right now, they're figuring all their costs indefinitely into the future at $33 a barrel. Or, mm-hmm. or 30 or whatever it is. They were probably buying three, four weeks ago when the producers were paying the customers to take it. Point is, but that was for the near term. That was an anomalous situation on the May futures, oil futures. But the point is that, uh, that either way, they're going to use it. Their costs, so first it's labor and then it's fuel and then it's probably a whole bunch of other expenses that we, you know, I haven't looked at airline stocks in years. They've got uh, terminals and, of course, capital intensive. But the fact is that airplanes use many, many times more fuel than they actually cost. It's the razor razor blade effect, right? So airlines can lock in their costs right now where they are three to five years into the future. It makes a lot of sense to do that, even if oil is going down to 20. Like you say, worst comes to worst, they'll go for another bailout. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, in the time we have left, there, there are other things to worry about out there that uh, that are kind of getting lost in the shuffle oh, of yes. the uh, uh, of the pandemic. And that are you, have you seen um, China and India? Yeah, they, they're, they they're moving to wanna, soldiers to their border. And, and, yeah, they yeah. want to seem to kill each other for some reason that nobody knows. India has not fared well in these uh, Sino-Indian wars in the past. And I got to believe they're probably not going to do too well now. But I guess uh, all the world's a stage, John. Oh, they're nuclear powers. Yeah. So this is, this is a very serious thing if it happens. And, and so Trump is uh, offering to be a mediator between China and India, which is, which is just <laughs> going to be fascinating to watch if it happens. Um, and then meanwhile, speaking of Trump, he's... Um, He's cracking down on social media now. They're in, they're in a battle over what should be censored and what shouldn't be. And so there's an executive order coming. And I don't, I don't know the details of the executive order, but it's going to be something about um, Twitter and Facebook not being allowed to censor political speech or something like that. And, you know, that's, that's if you're just thinking in terms of investing – it's not good for these big high flying companies like Facebook and and to an extent Google and uh, and Twitter to be in a pitched battle with the central government of their main country. So So however that turns out, that's probably a, a worry for stock investors. It's a huge mistake what they're doing anyway, because let's just assume we have a divided country 50 50, right? That's what they tell us. We'll assume that that's true. I don't necessarily buy it. I think a lot of the divisions are artificial. We'll talk about what's going on in Minnesota after this. Uh, Oh, yeah. But let's just say, because that fits in with other things we've been predicting all along, but let's just say that it's 50-50 country. When you alienate half your market, you become like Jimmy Kimmel. You become like late night TV. You lose half your audience. Now, granted, right now, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, Facebook, and Facebook is the least guilty of it, interestingly enough, but they still are. They are in dominant positions in their market. But by alienating 50% of the audience who will jump ship the second alternative is, is produced in the marketplace, this is a stupid business move 
And it's really an abuse of their fiduciary duty to their shareholders, which is like, don't get into politics, like make the uh, largest profits legally that you possibly can for your for your shareholders. Right. Well, these guys see, see, they don't want to be involved in this stuff at all. They, they, although they're really clumsy and politically motivated in their censorship now, they really don't want to do it. And, and we know that because they didn't start out doing it. The, um, the social media world was this wild west free for all at first, but then Congress called in all the CEOs and said, Oh, you, you let ISIS, uh, recruit by, by showing yeah. all their beheading videos and you let the Russians steal the election and everything. what are you going to do about it? You know, so these guys, you know, figured out that they have to have some kind of community standards, but they have no idea how to implement them uh, in part because the guys running tech companies are not representative of the U S as a whole. So their impulse and their, their sense of what's true and what's not true and what's reasonable speech and what's unreasonable uh, isn't shared by everybody. And so they're, you know, like you said, they're, they're in trying to do what the government is insisting that they do. They're making half their audience really mad. And Thank now you. that half, that half the audience includes the president. <laughs> <laughs> and that means it's so more than it's, half. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's insane thing. That, that they would do this. Uh, it's like, it's just that the idea of trying to control speech and effect, we, we've talked about this before and I don't want to dwell on it too much, but the fact is that they are the new public square, the new platform, they're the speaker's corner of, of society. And they let themselves get forced by China to censor and it's just become part of their business model now and really in and and the uh, the leaders of of these social media platforms all uh, basically lean left so there's a lot less resistance to it than there should have been it's just a big mistake john a huge mistake yeah, to make it's a mess it is a total mess and and we'll work it out i mean this is how democracies work it's it's a mess yeah until you come to a compromise that nobody's happy with. But then that's what everybody eventually accepts because <laughs> it's kind of the environment at that point, you know, yeah. and you just, you just take it as it is because that's how things are. And we're not quite at that point yet, but um, oh, we'll, get, we'll there. get there with social media. Yeah. And, uh, or, or we'll do the silo thing where there are three or four different flavors of social media and people will just stay in the silo that makes them the most comfortable and just ignore the stuff that, um, which is kind of how we, we work, work it now with cable news, yeah. right? It's unfortunate you know, that, though. It is unfortunate because then you yeah. wind up being in an echo chamber and, uh, you know, that's where new media comes in is breaking the echo chamber and not just telling you the pat view. There might be two pat well, views and then there's the other views that I'd like to think that you and I provide. See, okay, here, here, here's a possibly a path to a hopeful future in social media and podcasting and stuff. You, did you see what Joe Rogan did? Yeah, I saw that. Yes. And I'm jealous. So, uh, I so he it. just, well, you know, that, you, you probably, <laughs> your show's not worth that, the hundred million that his is worth Carrie. I'm willing to but take I'll bet half. You'll be surprised by how much it's worth. When you yeah. uh, when you value it according to Spotify's new standards, so yeah, it, you might be <laughs> way richer than you think you are. I'm feeling and rich, just not know it yet. <laughs> I'm feeling very rich now, John. <laughs> now that Joe Rogan's worth a hundred million, I got to be worth you know a certain percentage of that. I'm not going to yeah. speculate. Yeah, because here you only need a small yeah. fraction of a hundred million. Yeah, right? so true. Anyway, so enough of the new media crap. I'm tired of it. I'm really like kind of annoyed with the whole thing. But uh, we got to talk about uh, what's happening in Minneapolis. Oh, we got a breakdown yeah. of the social order. Uh, we've been talking about social unrest. Of course, they'll blame it on the, the cops, white cops shooting or killing a black guy. But it's not that. It's what we, you and I have been talking about for years, and we've seen it over and over again. It's social unrest due to uh, the strains on the global economy 
and the fabric of society that that creates. You know, if you were, um, if you were going to two weeks ago, choose which city you think was going to explode into civil unrest in the United States, where would Minneapolis have been on oh, that no. list? I would, I would have said <laughs> New York. There, no? <laughs> I would have said New York, Chicago, LA, one of those three. I would have never, ever. But, you know, these smaller cities, uh, industrial declining cities, which Minneapolis is one. Uh, and then you've got these huge job losses. And this is just a way for people to, for it to boil over. And I'm not condoning at all. Uh, the criminality that's taking place, the looting. You know, one of the things, John, I was thinking about this, it's a little sick, but technology has made looting so much easier because in the 60s, when you broke into the department stores, TVs were this huge boxes. You know, you had these consoles, RCA console, tubes, and it could take two people to carry one TV out. Now with flat screens, it makes it so much easier to be a looter doesn't it? Oh, you can stuff your pockets full of um, high-end yeah. um, cell phones and things like that and, and make All a fortune. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. So technology you is that, improving what, looting. <laughs> you think when a ride gets started that everybody would go straight to the Apple store in town, right? Because that's where the highest end you know, electronics can, are, are right there. But they the can take. brick them. They can brick yeah. them really quick. And they can brick the TVs too. This is the stupid part. Any smart TV is smart enough to shut you down. And all they got to do is, uh, I don't know if they're doing it or what, but all they got to do is report it to Samsung and boom, your TV is a brick on the wall. Another well, they, brick's they, on the wall. They can do something even better. They can turn the TV into a camera. Yeah. See who you are and then go get the TV back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not much of a market for used TVs, but they certainly can be arrested for possession of stolen property. There you go. Look, these things just aggravate the hell out of me because they're totally unnecessary. It's, it's a breakdown of leadership anytime you have these unfettered riots that, that just have to run their course. Leadership the, of your city, your state, and... It's just, uh, we saw it in Baltimore, we saw it in Missouri, and these things can be put down very quickly. They showed how to do it in Florida a couple of decades ago, which is that when you see a riots going on, you immediately go get the leaders and lock them up, and then you disperse the crowds and they leave. Florida learned how to do this years ago, and when I see it happen with no response from government, in effect, no response or the one in Baltimore, she said they have to destroy the city to get their anger out, something to that effect. She wound up getting indicted. Well, but, um, you know, it the, just is aggravating. You know, and, and another way to um, to stop these kinds of riots is to not have have your cops not kill people <laughs> all the time, you know, because it, right. it seems like every week there's some new video of a bunch of cops just murdering somebody who didn't deserve to be murdered. And uh, so which one was this? Was this the one where the guy was yeah, jogging and somebody breathe. came up with a shotgun and killed him? Or was this where they pinned him down, pinned him down. and he, ch he, he suffocated while he was saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Yeah. Well, you know, they, this all, is that one? they all say that. <laughs> yeah. It's terrible. Uh, no, I'm not justifying it. And, uh, it's disgusting and you need to, uh, put a stop to this, but the uh, idea of rioting and allowing riots to just go, it, it's all undermining the faith of, uh, that people have in government and, uh, and speeding the eventual demise of, uh, of the country and the uh, currency. Yeah. Well, and, and speaking of Hong Kong, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, we, that's we another really one, you know, because I'm uh, glad you that, raised those, that. Those were riots that were um, that went on for a really long time. Yeah, and now China is is using the current crisis as cover to go in there and clean up. And uh, and now Hong Kong, which is a a major global financial center, that was seen as a free market until very recently it looks like now it's just going to be another province of china which is a whole different thing for somebody for instance who, who does banking in uh, in yes. hong kong 
so or true. has investments there, you know, because you don't want necessarily to invest in a, um, a dictatorship if you can help it. A free market is a lot better place to invest. And, uh, you know, if it changes from the free market to a dictatorship, then the value of your investments in Hong Kong change commensurately. And so this is a big deal, too. Yeah, well, this will lead to more flight. I mean, we've already seen the capital flight to the U.S., to Canada. You know, all the people that were planning this uh, back in 99, I think it was 99 when they handed it over, uh, all their plans, why, why these cities uh, like New York, like Vancouver, all these places where the flight capital went, looks like they were pretty smart, doesn't it? Well, yeah. And, and that's pretty, uh, it's an obvious decision when you think about it. If you're living in a dictatorship and that system has allowed you to accumulate a lot of money, but there's no contract law, you know, there's no rule of any kind of law. It's basically whatever the, uh, the, the dictator says it is. Um, your next step is obviously to get that money out of the country once you've made it. So that, so yeah, I mean, Vancouver is what, like one third Chinese right now? Yeah, because they they, so many for... people from China have moved their, their fortunes into Vancouver because that's a, you know, it's a nice city and it's a very understandable city for the yes. Chinese. Or so, anyone, anyone, uh anywhere in the world. They speak English. They're nice. It's a well-run city compared to most. And we're really just seeing like natural outgrowth of, of what happened and showed that they were right to flee, to have that capital flight, to get their money out because this was inevitable from the get-go. And the question is how much violence will there be in Hong Kong and will they destroy Hong Kong to save it? so to speak, for for China. Well, it sounds like they're going to destroy aspects of Hong Kong for sure. And uh, yeah, it'll just be a question of how much of what we think of as Hong Kong survives this process. Um, and it may not be a whole lot because I, I think China's starting to see um, see very little point in leaving Hong Kong alone because all these riots were making China look bad. Yes. And and threatening because, you know, you can't have somebody stand up to a dictator without the dictator responding, because then everybody else realizes they can get away with the same thing and it's over for the dictator. So you can't allow civil unrest to go on. Uh, I, you know, it can go on a lot longer in a democracy where the government is legitimate than it can in a dictatorship where. You know, once you open the floodgates, you get swamped. So China probably feels a lot of pressure to deal with Hong Kong. And, and like Rahm Emanuel says, never let a good crisis go to, <laughs> go to waste. Yeah. Hey, we're living in the Rahm Emanuel world yeah. now. And that's unfortunate. Anyway, that's it for this week. Make sure you tune in next. Go to John's site, dollarcollapse.com. Sign up for his free newsletter. Sign up for ours. Write us. We love getting your emails and your comments. We haven't read your emails in a while. Promise in the next show or two we will. And uh, keep those YouTube comments flying. We, we always answer them as well. And just email us, kl at kerrylutz.com with your emails. And John, we will catch up with you next Monday. God only knows what will happen between now and then. Really? Okay. Talk to you soon, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.